Believe it or not, this ship was a symbol of Imperial security before the rebel scum started using it so effectively. What's up, meta-nerds? This video is all about the EF-76 Nebulon B Escort Frigate. We will get into its history and behind-the-scenes facts, but let's start with a breakdown. And keep an eye out for this Legends tag if you care about that distinction. It was manufactured by Kuat Driveyards soon after the Imperial transition, and each one would cost the Empire 8.5 million credits. That's more than twice the cost of the Arkudin's class light cruiser, and about 1 18th the Imperial 1 class Star Destroyer. They were built to escort cargo shipments across the galaxy, and thus were equipped with a class 2 hyperdrive, and one of the most reliable long-range communications arrays available. This way they could call for backup when ambushed by rebels or pirates, but it could also hold its own in a fight. The exterior is lined in an equal split of anti-capital ship and anti-starfighter weaponry, with 12 turbo lasers and 12 laser cannons. It also had dual tractor beam emitters for rescuing damaged allies, or disrupting the enemy's formations. And there was also a torpedo missile launcher variant, but it also contained hangar bays that could be filled with a combination of TIE fighters and shuttles, or just a max of two squadrons of TIE fighters. That would be a total of 24 TIEs. The deflector shield was located in this section, protecting the relatively weak connecting section and the engine array. Although it looks similar to the Imperial Command Bridge style, the actual bridge is located up here, more securely tucked away and surrounded by other similar looking structures. Its 7 ion engine array got it up to a top atmospheric speed of 1200 km per hour, or 746 miles per hour, making it as fast as a TIE fighter and much faster than an ISD. But it also has a megalite rating, or how fast it can go in space, of only 40, compared to 60 with the Star Destroyer and 100 in the TIE Fighter. Have fun trying to make sense of how it can be faster than a TIE Fighter in atmosphere, but slower than it in empty space. I'll see you down in the comments. You can see the large antennas that it utilized for long-range and short-range communication, and there are numerous docking tubes on this ship. Each could accommodate things from freighters to starfighters, and there are also multiple hangar bays on this section. One of its most unique design features were these triangular panels, which operated as static discharge vanes. That's important when constantly traveling in and out of planetary atmospheres, dust-filled asteroid belts, all while docking with numerous ships. As for its overall size, it was 300 meters or 984 feet long, making it less than one-fifth an ISD and about two X-wings shorter than the Arquidens class. Its width of 72 meters or 236 feet was 1 14th that of the ISD, or about three times the Millennium Falcon. At a height of 166 meters or 545 feet, it was about a third of the ISD and only a tall Wookiee above the requisite class light destroyer. If it was here on Earth, it would be about three football fields long, wider than 27 school buses, and nearly twice the height of the Statue of Liberty. Now as for its history, it was used in a wide variety of roles throughout the decades. It was produced shortly after the declaration of a new order, and would start off just guarding shipments. But these front pods could be tweaked endlessly. Some variants had them carry heavy ordnance and were used as a bomber. Some kept the starfighter complement at its highest and focused on search and destroy anti-starfighter roles, while others were search and rescue ships, leaving the hangars empty and guiding stranded vessels to safety with its tractor beams. But as early as 14 BBY, just five years after the Clone Wars, Rebels set their eyes on acquiring them. The first was Birch Teller and his cell, who attacked an escort moving the hyperdrive for the Death Star. By 2 BBY, we see that at least five were captured, showing up when Mon Mothma gave a rallying speech about her resigning from the Senate to lead a rebellion. The Rebels learned to fill these front pods with medical droids and other life-saving equipment, turning them into large medical frigates. Med Bay is right up front here, and in Legends there are 745 beds versus 700 in canon. This is similar to that of the Med Star class frigate used during the Clone Wars, a vessel that was a predecessor to the Nebulon B. But keep in mind that the 700 bed Med Bay is more than twice that of the commonly used Pelta class medical frigate also used during the war. Later in the year 2 BBY, three of them were under General Jan Dodonna's command when Grand Admiral Thrawn attacked Adalon. The Battle of Adalon would result in the loss of each of these Nebulon Bs, showing that their deflector shields were no match for a turbolaser bombardment from an Imperial Star Destroyer. Dodonna only narrowly survived by utilizing the escape pods. Over the next two years, at least one more Nebulon B was added to the Rebel fleets, because during the attack on Scarif, Admiral Raddus was now in command of three Nebulon Bs. One did escape, but the other two were destroyed during the battle when Darth Vader's ISD the Devastator unleashed a full barrage of turbolaser fire. 
Admiral Radis was killed that day, but Dodonna survived on to see the Battle of Yavin. After the Death Star's destruction, the rebels quickly evacuated Yavin and now maintained a mobile base, keeping the fleet constantly on the move. During this time, a Nebion V served as the rebel headquarters with Mon Mothma, Dodonna, and Akbar on board. From here, Han and Luke would go off on various missions, while Leia mostly focused on finding a new base of operations. They settled on Hoth, but when that was destroyed, they moved back to just staying in a mobile fleet up through the Battle of Endor. The Redemption was the vessel that treated Luke after his injuries on Cloud City. This Nebulon B would also be present during the attack on the Death Star 2. Two of them were present, but it's unclear if both survived. At least one of them made it to Muster Point Virgins, the meetup for Rebel Fleet Command 20 days after the Battle of Endor. The Rebels were now known as the New Republic, and one of the first places they raided was Kuat Driveyards, the manufacturers of everything from ISDs to Nebulon Bs. Now they had several of these frigates, and many took part in the Battle of Jakku. One would be remembered as one of the most badass Nebulons in history, as it continued to fire all of its weapons into a Star Destroyer, even after being cut in half by turbo laser fire. Another decided that it had to crash into Admiral Garrick Versio's flagship, the Eviscerator. This would prove the final blow to an already damaged destroyer. Decades later, some Nebulon Bs were still in service across the galaxy, with them being a staple in the Jinta security forces. Protecting the Jinta system and supporting the First Order, they were attacked by Aiden Versio and her daughter. They were able to eliminate the fighter escort and disable the Nebulon B's engines. In Legends, Kuat Driveyards produced a successor to the Nebulon B known as the Corona Class Frigate. These were sold exclusively to the New Republic, but were not a part of the modernization program, and thus not that many of them were produced. Some Nebulon Bs continued to serve the Corellian Defense Force, and one would make up a part of the Secret Retreat as late as 137 ABY. In canon, it gets replaced by the Nebulon C. Similar in appearance, but upped everything from the engines, armament, and nearly doubled the overall size. But turbo laser barrages were still the bane of this thing's existence. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. The Nebulon B first appeared in Empire Strikes Back, and was designed by Nilo Rodeo Hamero, who said he took inspiration from an outboard motor. There's a funny story referencing how many Nebulon Bs were stolen, where during the Battle of Uvo 4, one Imperial Admiral shouted an annoyance that maybe for once, they could destroy a rebel ship that wasn't already paid for by the Imperials. The reason why this ship was chosen as the HQ and the rebels were in between permanent bases, was because the sensor arrays were one of the best available, it being designed for transporting Imperial cargo, its long-range communication devices were some of the easiest to conceal and encrypt. And there is a small difference in the Legends and Canon numbers on the crew. Legends has it at 854, 66 of which are Gunners, with a minimum crew of 307. Canon simply has the total number at 850. It is a bit ironic that it was designed so that Rebels and Pirates couldn't find it, but that worked both ways once these ships were actually stolen and one of the most famous depictions of a Nebulon B is in the Force Unleashed series. The Salvation was named by Mon Mothma, and was commanded by Juno Eclipse, a former Imperial commander in charge of a former Imperial ship. During the assault on Kamino, it was sacrificed by sending it careening into Tamira City, destroying its shield generator and some of its cloning facilities. The reason why I didn't include the Salvation in the breakdown or history is because there are a lot of discrepancies that only happen on this ship. We can easily just say they're all upgrades, but critics point out that the amount of hangars, the increase in size overall, but also in those hangars and the bridge, are only seen with this Nebulon B's depiction, but nowhere else. Of course, it is badass nonetheless, and I kinda love how it's depicted, just write it off as a variant. A lot of the breakdown info comes from guidebooks like the Encyclopedia of Starfighters, Ultimate Star Wars, The Rebel Files, and The Last Jedi cross-sections, and Legends details come from the Essential Guide to Vehicles and Vessels, Rebel Alliance source books, and the Essential Guide to Warfare. Honestly, if you're thinking about picking them up, the Legends books here are a lot better, but of course they may differ from the new canon depictions. So that's it for the Nebulon B. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can support our channel without it costing you a thing, or check out our Patreon, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, Invest all your money in Kuat Driveyard stock, and the Force will be with you, always.